traveling through women's history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. You weave your way down a dusty street, trying to get your bearings. You move past shops full of customers and bright stalls full of produce, past public baths and the shouts from the Colosseum. You skirt past a shrine and a slave market, too. It is loud, busy, bustling, humming with industry and ambition. Everyone here wants to rise to some kind of greatness, to grasp what power they can. And though you're a woman, you aren't exempt from dreams of glory. Your path toward it might look different than the men around you, but that doesn't mean you can't make a name for yourself here. After all, this is your city. This is ancient Rome. In this chapter of Season 2, we'll meet the women who lived amid this ancient world juggernaut. Many are Roman citizens, the wives and daughters and sisters of influential men who use every tool at their disposal to leave a lasting mark on their fast-changing world, and to survive its cutthroat rules about what women are allowed to do and be. Others are foreigners who refuse to bow to the ever-expanding empire, fighting against it with both cunning and spears. We will explore the events and laws they had to navigate, the intrigues and wars in which they have a hand. And as always, we'll try to understand what life was like in ancient Rome for women. What did it look like through their eyes? Lucky for us, we have some expert time-traveling companions. Hi, I'm Dr. Rad. I'm a specialist in all things Spartacus and historical films. And I am Dr. G. Um, I'm an expert on ancient Rome, particularly uh, ancient priestesses, and then even more particularly, the Festival Virgins. And together, we host a podcast called The Partial Historians, which at the moment is a narrative podcast where we're tracing the journey of Rome from the founding of the city. I'm Dr. Rhiannon Evans. I'm the Associate Professor of Classics and Ancient History at La Trobe University, and I'm the, the main guest on the podcast Emperors of Rome. Grab a really long sheet and a few vials of poison, just in case. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. My pirate queens, Anna, Becky, Chloe, Emily. Gaia, Jackie, Jessica B, Kayla, Mikkel, Morgan, Olivia, Sarah, Stephanie, and Wendy. And my lady presidents, Amanda, Amy, Brendan, Audrey, Belinda, Caroline, Cassie, Claire, Courtney, Courtney H, Dana, Debbie, Diana, Edie, Elizabeth M, Elizabeth G, Ellie, Eve, Jeanette, Jessica S, Caitlin, Karen R, Casey, Kat, Kelly, Kelly F, Kim, Larissa, Lauren, Lori, Louisa, Mary, Meg, Nancy, Nicole, Paul, Pamela, Sasha, and Townsend. And to the Imperators and Augustas who donate more each month than I've asked for. Avery, Karen C., and Jackie C. Becoming a patron really helps keep the show going, and you'll get access to sneak peeks, discounts on merch, and exclusive bonus episodes. To find out more, just go to my website. A few words before we really get going. Though we have plenty of marble busts of ancient Roman women to stare at, what we know about their lives and times is far from cast in stone. Our sources for how they conducted themselves day to day rely on ancient writers, pretty much all of whom are men, and whose attitudes and agenda are not always female positive. When they're not shoving women to the sidelines of their histories, they're either demonizing them for their wanton ways or putting them up on a glittering pedestal, presenting us with what women should be. We have other sources to draw from. There's archaeology, tombs, and ancient art. Though even these give us a specific and not always generally applicable window. So while we walk through the Roman world, trying to see it through the eyes of a lady, keep in mind that the ground beneath our feet is often more sand than sandstone. Take everything with a healthy dash or two of ancient salt. 
As with all the ancient empires we've traveled to so far, we need to define what we mean by ancient Rome. We're covering a lot of ground here. The Western Roman Empire starts to take shape around 753 BCE and continues on until 476 CE. And the Eastern Roman Empire continues on for quite a while after that, around another thousand years or so. That's some 2,000 years of Roman goodness, and of course our lives are going to change depending on where we land within it. So let's take a hop-skipping tour down ancient Rome's timeline. Getting a ladybird's eye view of the civilization we'll soon be walking through. This might be a little longer than usual, but hang with me. This is info we really need to understand the Roman woman's world. Ancient Rome starts out as a kingdom around 753 BCE. How this city was founded is a matter of much debate. Let's linger over this for a minute, as it sets the scene for our understanding of the Roman psyche, and particularly how it views its women. Unsurprisingly, the Romans have a pretty dramatic legend about their founding. The story goes that long ago, a man named Aeneas and some of his friends escaped from the tire fire that was the Trojan War, went to Italy, and became king of a land called Alba Longa. Some legends say that Rome would eventually be named after Roma, a woman who traveled with Aeneas. Upon landing on the Tiber, Roma and her ladies weren't best pleased about moving on from what seemed like a perfectly good place to found a city to them. So her posse burned the Trojan ships, purposefully stranding them. Much better. A few generations later, two brothers had a fight over who had the right to rule it. The victorious brother, Amulius, killed his brother Numitor's sons and exiled his daughter, Rhea Silvia. He made her become a Vestal Virgin, a priestess position we will talk about a lot more later, to ensure that she wouldn't give birth to future rivals. But the gods sure loved to stir the pot, so Mars, the god of war, came down and raped Rhea Silvia, and nine months later she gave birth to twins, Romulus and Remus. A warrior taking a woman by force. Not an origin story I'd be super excited about, but we're going to see this whole thing play out again. Feeling threatened by these teeny babes, but not wanting to piss off the god of war, Amulius imprisons Rhea Silvia and has the babies abandoned by the Tiber. I mean, it's not murder when you abandon kids and let the fates decide if they live, is it? The twins are rescued by a she-wolf, who feeds and takes care of them until a shepherd named Faustulus comes along and adopts them, raising them in what will one day become Rome's Palatine Hill. When they got older, they decided they didn't want to rule old Alba Longa anyway. Boring! but found a new city all their own. As twins will do, they fought over exactly where they should found it. Much shoving and petty insults later, Romulus killed Remus and named the new city after himself. Bold choice! To get his Roman party started, Romulus invited a colorful cast of characters to come and live in his new city. Cutthroats, runaway slaves, former prisoners. Come on down! But there was a problem. None of them were going to be producing any progeny without a lady or two in the mix. Where are my ladies at? So he called up his neighbors, the Sabines. Hey, you guys. Rome here. Want to send us some of your women so we can fill up our new city with strapping Roman youths? Nah, we're good. Screw you and your goat, then. And one week later... Hey, you guys. Rome again. Totally just kidding about the whole goat thing. Want to come over to this festival we're throwing? We're totally not going to steal your women during it. We just want to get you toasted. They get the Sabines drunk as skunks, then proceed to kidnap their wives and daughters. It's kind of like the musical Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, but with a whole lot less singing. Romulus then pressures these women to marry his Roman men. Livy tells us that he gives a rousing speech promising they should be joined in lawful wedlock, participate in all their possessions and civil privileges, and than which nothing can be dearer to the human heart in their common children. Tempting after a violent kidnap, Romulus. Very tempting. 
But when the Sabine menfolk come back in a rage to battle the Romans for their women, they intervene, showcasing some serious Stockholm Syndrome. If you are dissatisfied with the affinity between you, the ladies say, if with our marriages turn your resentment against us, we are the cause of war. We of wounds and of bloodshed to our husbands and parents. It were better that we perish than live widowed or fatherless without one or other of you. In other words, please don't fight. We'd rather die than cause any trouble. Does this sound like a myth written by a man or what? But it does show us what matters to the Romans, respect for the father and for the gods for one. For the other, the role women have to play as bridge builders, the link that holds societies chained together and create peace between men, even when it comes at their expense. Wife napping complete, Rome started to grow in earnest. For a while, it was ruled by kings, all elected by the people, and the city developed into an up-and-coming urban center, quickly outpacing many of its rivals. But by 509, the populace was growing tired of answering to royal overlords, and then a woman named Lucretia pushed them over the edge. The probably mythical story goes that she was sexually assaulted by a guy named Sextus Tarquinius, the son of the current king. Apparently, one evening he had some friends over for drinks, one of whom was Lucretia's husband, Colatinus. A few bottles deep, they all started debating whose wife was the best, as you do, and Colatinus insists that Lucretia would put them all to shame. So they rode around to each man's house to see what their wives were up to. They found them all getting ready for a night on the town, but not Lucretia. She was weaving dutifully with her maids. Prince Sextus was so impressed by her modesty that he returned several nights later, when Colatinus was conveniently out of town, and asked if he could stay on over. Being a good hostess, Lucretia said, sure, here's some food and a guest room, while probably also sighing internally with a, I wish you'd stop checking out my boobs already. Later that night, Sextus crept past her sleeping servants into her bedroom and declared his passionate love for her. Yikes. She refused to submit to him, until he told her that if she didn't, he would kill her and lie her naked body next to one of her slaves, so that everyone would think she died in the midst of adultery. Post-assault, she bravely wrote to her husband and father to come at once and told them all about it. First, she asked them to win vengeance for her, and though they tried to tell her that it wasn't her fault, Livy tells us, she said, Though I acquit myself of the sin, I do not absolve myself from punishment. Not in time to come shall ever unchaste women live through the example of Lucretia. She grabs a knife and commits suicide rather than live with her honor tainted. Her raging male relatives carried her body into the street, stirring up the public's anger, and then went after Sextus with everything they had. In doing so, they effectively killed Rome's monarchy. One of the guys who accomplished this was named Lucius Junius Brutus. We'll return to that name in a minute. Though it's entirely likely that she's mythical, you could say that a woman helped birth the Roman Republic. Are we sensing a disturbingly violent trend? Again, we learn a lot here about how Romans think about women. First, that though everyone agreed the assault was not Lucretia's fault, the shame and dishonor of it still stand squarely on her shoulders. Second, that a good woman is both fierce, demanding vengeance, and brave, able to take her own life, which she has to do because she can't ever be that honorable woman again. We also see how a woman's fate has the power to change the course of history, though often she's not doing it by fighting, but by dying, which is a somewhat worrying precedent to set. And so Rome was now a republic, set up by a group of ancient aristocratic families known as the Patricians. Never again will they suffer a king, they swear, and their aversion to royalty works its way down the generations. The people get to elect their own magistrates, men who make decisions on everyone's behalf. They're advised by the rich guys who make up the Senate, a government body that is chosen by the city's wealthy and made up of Patricians. A Senate position is for life, so they're powerful, but they're kept in check by two consuls. These guys are probably the most powerful in Rome, but they can only be a consul for a year at a time. That's important. 
This system of checks and balances is a far cry from Greece's absolute democracy, but it means that no one man has absolute power, for now, and women have little power at all. The Republic kicks along for quite a while fairly happily, but unrest and inner strife start to break things apart. There are growing resentments between patricians and plebeians, the working class, that erupt into strikes and other trouble. And as the territory expands, we see great generals emerge, who become very rich, very famous, and develop massively inflated egos, often with big and loyal armies at their backs. We see these generals start to change things. A guy named Marius ends up consul an unprecedented seven times. Another guy named Sulla goes against him, sparking Rome's first civil war. And eventually, with Rome in the middle of a wartime emergency, Sulla steps up and names himself a temporary dictator. Many heads are hung up in the forum, things are getting quite bloody. But they eventually settle down again, and people assume the Republic will go on as before. But no dice, because there were plenty of young men who looked up to Marius and Sulla and were like, Hey, they did it. Maybe I can too. And so along comes a guy named Julius Caesar. This fallen rich boy and military star does many fascinating things, some of which we'll talk about when we explore the women who pass through his orbit. He recites poetry for pirates, he leads many military campaigns to surprising victories, and he sleeps with many people's wives. But one of the most bizarre and impressive things he did, with help from his fellow triumvirates Pompey and Crassus, was kick down the final straws of the Roman Republic and send it careening toward an empire with, well, not a king exactly, but a system where one man, and sometimes the woman next to him, can rule the world. And so Caesar declares himself dictator, not just for now, but for life. But then he starts acting a little too kingly, a little too loudly, and the Senate starts sharpening their knives. One of those guys was a fellow named Brutus, remember that name? Who feels, given his family's history, that it's his personal mission to make sure no king ever rules Rome again. And so, in 44 BCE, they stab him an outlandish number of times, right in the middle of the forum. Et tu, Brute? The assassins turn around, throw up their bloody hands, and say, Look, everybody, no more pretend kings. Let's get back to business as usual, shall we? But the people aren't grateful. They are pissed. And so the assassins run, and some new, ambitious young men step in to chase them. Octavian, Caesar's adopted son, his best bro Mark Antony, and another guy named Lepidus. After battling the assassins for a while, and then battling each other for who will be the champion of Rome, Octavian eventually emerges victorious. And after almost 200 years of continual war and severed heads hung up around the city, everyone's tired and just wants things to calm down. And that's how Octavian takes the name Augustus and becomes Rome's first emperor. Though he spends his whole life insisting that he isn't really an emperor. Don't worry, guys. We're still a republic. Like, I'm not an absolute ruler. No, no. I'm just princeps, or first citizen. And the Senate still has a lot of power. I just happen to be really smart, and everyone knows that my decisions are the best decisions, so... And so Rome says, yeah, fine, okay, let's all pretend you're not really in charge. But this is definitely not a monarchy. The Senate is still very much a thing and does have power, which is a thing that every emperor has to grapple with. After Augustus dies, we see many more emperors who are less shy about claiming their power. Some are great, some just okay. Some are too busy cross-dressing and throwing giant ragers to govern effectively. And some are just downright crazy. We'll meet a few of them later, but if you want a full and very pretty graphic that gives you the emperor rundown, check out the timeline of Roman emperors that author Pamela Toller and I made just for you. You can peruse it in the show notes, or you can buy yourself the poster-sized version in my Etsy shop. Don't worry, it's full of the influential women around the emperors, too, and some of the ones who oppose them. Naturally. Back to the empire. Its real heyday stretches from 29 BCE to around 180 CE. Thanks to ambitious rulers and a truly killer military, at its peak the empire has control of everything the Mediterranean touches. And then some. 
It gets so big that the empire has to split into two because it's just too vast to be ruled from one city. But eventually, things start falling apart. Bad and short-lived emperors, plague, invasion, so much stabbing. By 476 CE, the Western Empire has fallen. The Eastern Empire and its capital city of Constantinople will keep on thriving for quite a long time. We'll get a glimpse at several of these periods in much more detail as we move from one interesting lady to the next in our series. But since we've got to settle somewhere, let's explore life as fairly fancy patrician matronas, or married women, at the height of the empire in the year 110 CE. Before we roll out of bed and get going, we've got to sort out who exactly we are. What a lady's average day looks like in Rome depends very much on their socioeconomic status and, importantly, whether they are slave or free. If you're foreign, even if you are freeborn, you have limited rights within the empire. But if you're a citizen of any station, you have some coveted rights. Suffragium, or the right to vote commercium, or the right to enter into legal contracts, and connubium, or the right to marry. We lady citizens, of course, are not entitled to all three, but we'll get into that a little later. If there are two things we Romans are obsessed with, it's family and status. Our place in the scheme of things will depend on our ancestry, how much money we have, what kinds of honors we've won, or probably that our husbands or fathers have won for us, and our citizenship. Our gens, or family clan, is everything. It dictates our name, our status, our place, and our rights. It's one of the most important things about us. Remember that. At the top of the power pyramid sits those ancient patrician families who started the Republic, including the Emperor and his family. This wealthy upper class is well-connected and tends to hold most of the high political and religious positions. Then there are the equestrians, or knights, one rung below. You could say they're the business class of ancient Rome. To be an equus, a man has to prove he holds property valued at 40,000 sesterces, while a senator has to prove he's worth 1 million. So that paints a bit of a picture. And then there are the common folk, called plebeians or plebs. Below them are freedmen and women, those who were once enslaved but have found their way to freedom. Though considered low class, some freedmen become wealthy and influential. And then, below that, there are a whole lot of slaves. It's tough to move up the Roman power ladder, but not impossible. Rome's a city full of clients and patrons, people making deals and alliances, always seeking to improve their lot. Let's say our family is fairly well-to-do, from good patrician stock. That being the case, our house, or domus, is likely to be on one of Rome's seven hills. The higher up we are, the better off. It's cleaner up on the hill, the view is better, and the smells from the teeming city below are less troublesome. We wake early, as no electricity means we tend to work in time with the sun's rise and fall. Roll over on what's probably a mattress stuffed with straw, wool, or even leaves, and let's get started. We'll probably be waking on the second floor, the domain of women and servants. Enjoy the solitude, if you happen to have it, because in our very full house, privacy is going to be a hard thing to come by. The room we sleep in is called a cubiculum. Yes, that sounds like cubicle for a reason, and that's just about how small it is. Dark and cell-like, with no windows, it has room for sleeping and not much else. Our house is rather like a fortress, pretty from the outside, but built to block out the noisy, sometimes stinky world outside. So though you're likely to have some pretty frescoes on your walls, you can only admire them once your eyes have adjusted or if you've lit the lantern near your bed. The house is prone to drafts as well, so if it's winter, there might also be a brazier on the floor to keep you warm, so try not to trip over that. Our first stop of the morning might be the latrina, which is our at-home toilet. Most well-to-do houses will have them. Emperor Hadrian's villa will feature 35 such toilets, though the average home probably only has a few. 
It's likely to be upstairs or down near the kitchen or out in the courtyard to try and mitigate some of the smell. It's likely to be a single seater, unlike in the public restrooms we'll visit later, built into the wall and hopefully with a door to close behind us. The seat is made of either wood or marble, and the hole is shaped something like a keyhole, just like our modern toilets. It's likely to either be a cesspit toilet or have a terracotta drain pipe leading to a discreet downstairs location or perhaps even the street. To wipe, we might be using a sponge on a stick, which we will share with the other members of our household. No thank you. Or we might be using a hanky, or even just our hands. I mean, we are going to wash them off in a minute. That method sounds gross to us, but is certainly the most environmentally effective. Who uses what toilet is probably tied to your status in the household. Given our obsession with it, I can't imagine we Matroni are sharing a bathroom with the slave who does our hair, but I could certainly be wrong feel like hitting the shower? Well, that's not happening. Though we Romans are fairly famous for our cleanliness, full bathing doesn't often happen inside our homes. Bathtubs do exist in some of the richer houses, but they tend to be a rarity. At most, you might fill a basin with water and give your hands and face a rinse. But is that water clean? Where does it come from? In this respect, we're in luck because Romans have perfected the art of water transport. Rome built its first mighty aqueduct back in 312 BCE, setting a precedent for water purity, control, and extensive plumbing that won't be matched again for millennia. You can see these structures from far outside the city. As iconic a site as New York City's skyline, carrying water from far afield into our streets and alleys. Though much of the 250-mile system is actually built underground, they really are a big ancient world deal. All the abundant supply of water, Pliny tells us, for public buildings, baths, and gardens coming from such a distance, tunneling through mountain and leveling the route through deep valleys must make this the most remarkable achievement anywhere in the world. Relying on gravity to keep things moving, they usher water down waterproofed beds made of concrete, which is actually a Roman invention. Though it's not quite like the stuff we pour into sidewalks, it's created with volcanic ash, lime, and seawater mixed in with volcanic rock. It's more durable than the stuff we make. It even gets stronger over time. Specialized workers known as aquari keep them clean, along with special tanks called piscine limariae, where impurities can be decanted. By the time the water collects at the end in a reservoir, where it is stored and then released into lead pipes that make it to most street corners, it's shockingly clean for an era well before water purification plants. They're carrying a lot of water. Once the last of Rome's aqueducts is built in 226 CE, we think that the entire system is delivering some 1.5 million cubic yards of water per day. That's about 200 gallons per person. It's used for everything from cleaning and cooking to public fountains and industrial water mills. Having it piped into your house comes at a hefty price. You pay based on the diameter of your access pipe. Some enterprising souls build their own illicit pipes off the public water system to keep their gardens green, but it's not exactly legal. And of course, it feeds our voracious love of public bathing. But going to the bath is an afternoon activity, and one we'll need to leave the house for. So for now, let's go ahead and get dressed. Rome is a place where what you wear can say a lot about who you are and how people should treat you. Downstairs in his bedroom, your son will be stretching his arms, rolling out of bed in a loincloth and tunic that he probably slept in, then having a slave help him get into his toga. This is the standard outfit for adult male citizens. He'll have to think carefully about what his toga looks like, though, as our sumptuary laws dictate quite strictly who can wear what. Togas trimmed with purple are only for boys under 16, called a toga pretexta. But once he is initiated into the world of men, his toga will be white. It's called the toga virilis, and getting to wear one means you're officially a man. How he's keeping it clean is another story. You will be sporting what in some ways is quite a similar looking outfit, though you wouldn't be caught dead wearing a toga. 
I mean, you could, but then people would think you're either a prostitute or an adulteress, which is probably not the look we're going for. Another important thing to note, the more skin you're showing, the less respectable people are going to find you, and the lower status they'll assume you are. Only slave girls and women of the evening bear their ankles in public. Such things might cause public unrest. Let's pause in the nude for a minute. Keep in mind that a lot of our knowledge about what women are wearing comes from statues and funeral reliefs, all carved by men. They serve as something akin to an Instagram feed, an artful idealization of what we want people to think we look like, but not necessarily the best evidence for our actual day-to-day. -day. Luckily, Dr. Rad and Dr. G are here to help. But first, let's meet them properly. Hello, fellow listeners of The Explorers. We are Dr. G and Dr. Rad. We host a podcast on ancient Rome called The Partial Historians. If you're interested in getting behind the story of Rome, learning more about Roman popular culture, and you worship women like Livia, Messalina, and the Vestal Virgins, join our conversation. You can find us by searching for The Partial Historians or at partialhistorians.com. We're also active on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And now back to the Explorers. Enjoy, Enjoy the show! So first, let's deal with our undies. Are we wearing any? The answer seems to be maybe. It seems that there's not a lot of underwear like we would recognize it going on. We There are images of people wearing what looks like modern underwear to us, but that's probably because they were people who were, engage, who were engaged in some sort of physical activity, which meant that they couldn't wear what a Roman would normally wear. You know, so they had to sort of strip off for whatever reason. Um, like a gladiator, for example, would wear like a sort of loincloth type thing, but he probably wouldn't wear that when he's just wandering around the streets normally. Whatever under things we're wearing are called subligatulum, or a little something underneath. While our son is probably wearing either nothing under all his layers or something akin to a loincloth, it's possible that our underwear is a bit more elegant, probably made of linen imported from Egypt. But here's a fun fact. We might also be wearing the equivalent of some leather bikini briefs. There is potentially some evidence that women might have worn at some point some sort of like leather bikini like maybe when they had their period or something, or if they were working out, but it's very speculative. <laughs> There's some evidence that they're made out of goat skin. Not very breathable, I would imagine, but definitely waterproof. We'll have a bra as well, called a strophium, which is there to bind and lift up our lady orbs. Women would wear a, like a sort of breastband, and it seems like a respectable woman would keep that on even when she was having sex. Our friend Ovid, who seems particularly keen to give ladies advice about how to look their sexiest, tells us that if our breasts aren't quite the right shape, we can always stuff our bras. Thanks, Ovid. Dr. Rad and Dr. G concur. It is versatile. So it seems that this could be worn a number of different ways, kind of like there are different kinds of bras, in that women could potentially wear them to pad themselves out like a like a padded bra um, so if you wanted to make yourself look bigger than you actually were you could potentially wrap around more fabric so that your boobs you know appeared bigger than they were or you could potentially wrap in a certain way to maybe provide a bit more emphasis uh, or you know a bit more of a cleavagey look potentially it also goes the other way in that you could potentially wear your breastband so that your boobs are minimized or you know strapped down essentially but are all women wearing these wraparound bras? Possibly the kinds of women that didn't wear this would be prostitutes, presumably because it would be tricky to take off quickly. <laughs> we do have sources that say that prostitutes um, could suddenly flash passerbys and show, the, show their breasts, so that would imply that they're not wearing it. But having said that, again, we do have images in art in places like Pompeii, for example, where women are shown having sex and some of them are wearing it and some of them aren't. But presumably respectable women would be wearing one. And, and we do have references to like slave girls wearing one. So it seems that, yeah, a lot of women probably been wearing like a breastband of some kind. The body ideal we're shooting for is thin, but with hips wide enough to suggest our potential success at childbearing. But we respectable matroni are not wandering the streets showing off any skin or cleavage. Layers are most definitely the name of the game. 
we're probably putting on some kind of slip. It seems that there may have been like an underlayer uh, before we get to the sort of main garment that most women would have worn. So um, something called like a supperus or like an under tunic. This is just one layer of several, which, if Roman poet Marshall has anything to say about it, is going to cause us some distress when we're out. Your unhappy garments, Lesbia, treat you indecently. When you attempt with your right hand, attempt with your left, to pluck them away, you wretch them out with tears and groans. They are so gripped by the straits of your mighty rump. So yes, once we're fully dressed, picking that wedgie is going to be a laborious process. One thing we will definitely all be wearing is a tunic. So the tunic is like your staple garment that everyone would have worn. Uh, And the main differences, as far as women were concerned, probably would have come from like what status you were. Um, So you basically, uh, if you were an elite woman, you probably would have been wearing a tunic that would go all the way down to your feet and provide, you know, basically coverage um, because you're a respectable Roman woman. How stifling. (laughs) Exactly. No showing off those ankles. After that, since we are fancy ladies, we will pull on our stola, which goes all the way down to our feet. In fact, it might even be longer, so we'll need to pull it up around the belt we will soon be wearing, kind of like you would a loosely tucked in t-shirt. And this is basically like the female equivalent of the toga in that it's something you would wear to show off your status as a citizen Roman married woman. Despite what you've seen in period films, your arms and cleavage are not likely to be on display here. The top edges of your stola will probably cover your upper arms, either stitched at the shoulders or pinned all along to show only teeny peeps of skin. That might change if we're of a lower station. Slave women usually have their tunic fall just above their knees, as it's more practical for their duties. And as a helpful bonus, this helps us know at a glance who is who and how we should treat them. When it comes to our clothes, class is everything. This is something that the Romans are sort of constantly wrestling with. They have what seems to be a fairly clear dress code so that you can tell who someone is in terms of their social standing just by looking at them. But that starts to get muddy very quickly because, of course, if you're an upper-class person, do you want your attendants who are slaves to be walking around in rags? Probably not. You probably want them to be dressed, you know, reasonably nicely too. And we do have records of this. And there's definitely always anxiety about can you really tell who's who? Like what if a slave girl got dressed up in upper class clothing? Could you tell that she was actually a slave? It, you know, it's 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 much muddier than than you would you would believe when you sort of first look at the kind of clothing that they are supposed to be wearing. Oh, the horror of it all. <laughs> but you couldn't tell on sight exactly who somebody was. You couldn't tell that they were as <laughs> lower class. Blah. We might belt our stola underneath our breast to create some artful folds, then cinch it in with a thicker belt at our waist. The look we're going for is small breasts up top and some serious curves down under. Though it's likely we're going to be so wrapped up in our next garment that I'm not sure how many admiring men or women on the street might notice. There's evidence to suggest that women are no longer wearing this iconic piece of clothing, but just a tunic, which makes sense given the weather conditions. Think about the Italian summer. It's hot. It's sweaty. You're thinking about having a drink, but instead you're wrapped up in a whole bundle of fabric like some sort of weird cocoon. Later, when we go out of the house, we'll wrap ourselves in our pala, a two-meter-wide, six-meter-long scarf and cloak combo that will hang in heavy folds and cover up much of our bodies. But we might need some help from a servant to do it. So this is a a fairly large piece of fabric that women would wear in in various different ways, um, but draped around the sort of shoulders and head and that sort of area. This is what sometimes in art, unfortunately, stops us from seeing the stola in all its glory (laughs) when they are wearing a stola, because um, as Dr. G and I can both attest, because we've tried this out ourselves, it's a huge amount of fabric. And yeah, the pallor is gigantic. Yeah, it's really hard to actually do anything while you're wearing it. It's quite constrictive. Sometimes the end will be thrown over our shoulders, with the end dangling down in front and the other end drawn around the back and brought around. Likely you'll need to carry at least one end in your arms, so don't plan on dancing a jig or doing any calisthenics. I think that's Part of the important thing about the stola and the pallor is that they are 
uncomfortable and unwieldy garments. And yeah. so in a way, they become a real visual signifier for the upper class because who can afford to not have a fully functioning body yeah. when they're out in public? And it's really only the elites who, one, have the capacity to show off that they can possess such fabrics, yes. but also to just be so uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not do a lot. Yeah. And not, not really have to do much, um, just sort of parade around and, and have a, a particular appearance in the public space. It's so big that we can even cover our heads with it. Some sources say that married women always cover their heads in public but we don't know if that's actually true, so I'll leave that decision up to you. Our clothing is probably made of either linen or wool, though they could be cotton. If we're feeling fancy and have the money to afford it, they might also be silk, brought from all the way over in Asia. We'll want to be careful, though, because Romans have some serious anxieties about seeming either too loose or too excessive when it comes to our outfits. There's always a sort of a moral conversation in the Roman texts about what people in general are wearing, but particularly women. Um, there's always a fine line between appearing, you know, refined and civilized and, and showing off your status and going too far and being too luxurious. The Romans lose their minds over this kind of stuff all the time, with both men and women, but particularly women. Our palas are likely to be colorful, too. While statues of old probably have you picturing our get-ups as all white and sheet-like, we Roman ladies love color. In fact, ancient world Greek and Roman statues weren't originally white at all, but painted. That whole minimalist chic thing we associate with them is just a product of paint fading over time. Our dyes are made from plant-based materials, and it's expensive, so most of your everyday people are wearing black, brown, gray, and cream. Hot tip, do not wrap yourself head to toe in purple, as that's the emperor's color, and you're going to get in trouble if you choose to flounce about in that. Anyway, it's royally hard to come by. Pliny the Elder tells us that it's made from the Murex mollusk and that it takes 10,000 of the shellfish to make just one gram of dye. A pound of nice purple silk will run you 100,000 denarii, which will also buy you half a dozen slaves or a pet lion. So... Red is also considered a power color, made from crushed roots or bugs, whereas white is used for ceremonies and holidays. How do we keep all our white so white, you wonder? We have people called fullers to launder our clothes. They use uric acid to keep our woolen garments looking good, and thus often ask Rome citizens to donate their pee for that purpose. There's nothing quite like the smell of pea-starched tunics in the morning. These decisions about dress may seem trivial, but they're anything but. In a world where women can't vote, and in fact only have so much power in the public sphere, what they wear really matters, both as expression of their social situation and status. It can tell viewers how important they are and if they're married. It's one of the clearest modes of expression women have. And we aren't about to give it up for anything. Back in 215 BCE, the city's rulers passed a wartime austerity measure called the Lex Appia, a sumptuary law aimed at curbing what women could wear and do in public. After the war ended and there were noises about keeping that law in place, women from inside and outside the city stormed the forum, taking to the streets and intimidating voting men into submission. We'll dive into this moment more in a future episode, but suffice it to say that dress matters. Now that we're dressed, it's time for hair and makeup. Downstairs in his chambers, your husband is probably going through a series of his own beauty rituals. Since Alexander the Great set the trend for going beardless, he has to get the dreaded beard shave, done by a servant or slave, and then has that servant pluck his eyebrows and any stray neck hairs. So we can comfort ourselves that we aren't the only ones suffering for beauty. Suetonius tells us that Augustus, Rome's first emperor, was known to depilate his leg hairs by rubbing them with scalding hot walnut shells. Dang, Augustus, that's commitment. Not that we're exempt from this torturous game. The poet Ovid, in his book The Art of Love, mentions how important it is to deal with our underarm goat and bristling hairy legs. If we want to be considered fine ladies. Thanks, Ovid. We'll get right onto that. 
But first, let's deal with skincare. Hang on tight, because this might take a while. It's worth noting here that this beauty regimen is probably only enjoyed by the very upper classes, as they're the ones with the time and the money to afford them. It's also worth keeping in mind that a lot of our information about said beauty rituals comes from the writings of men, some of which are meant to be satirical and are often meant to be judgmental. In terms of skincare, we feel quite strongly about it. Roman women feel a lot of pressure to have smooth, unblemished skin. It's a sign of health, of good living, and of general sexiness. In the ancient world, which is full of barely treatable diseases, this has got to be a difficult thing to achieve. Pliny the Elder mentions a whole host of potential skin problems we might have to deal with. Pimples, freckles, spots, facial itching, eruptive skin diseases, leprous sores, and scars, to name a few. Luckily, we have a wide array of both mundane and bizarre skin concoctions for treating them. Some of the ingredients we're slathering on are ones the modern-day lady will have no problem getting down with. Olive and almond oil, honey, fruit juice, seeds, mushrooms, poppy, rose water, and many forms of fat, both plant and animal. Others are a little more adventurous. For example, cow placenta is supposed to be great for curing skin ulcers. Bull bile stains the face a pleasing hue. For wrinkles, there's always swan's fat, ass's milk, or axle grease. For freckles, there is ash of snails. Overnight, we may even have slept in a face mask made of grease derived from unwashed sheep's wool, which Ovid complains will offend all noses. And this is only a partial list. One of our primary objectives is to look as pale as possible. Tan skin is a sign of the working class, and as patrician ladies, we wouldn't want to be confused with one of them. We have many lotions and creams to help us with this aim. Narcissus bulb, cantaloupe root, and cumin are all handy whiteners and probably aren't going to corrupt your inner organs. Archaeologists have found evidence of facial creams containing animal fat, starch, and lead or tin oxide, which when rubbed on will leave a smooth, powdery texture and make the skin appear paler. Lead is great for luminous skin, ladies. Just ask Elizabeth I in a few years. Too bad it builds up in your system, doing all sorts of nefarious things. We might also use white marl, a type of clay, or chalk dust to achieve a ghostly glow. Later, we might even bathe in some ass's milk. Rumor has it that Cleopatra was a fan, and it's supposed to help make us pasty as hell. And then, of course, there's that old Egyptian staple, crocodile dung. Galen says it is highly prized in Rome as well. It is not enough that there are countless other cosmetics by which their faces are made smooth and shiny, he says. No, they also include the dung of crocodiles. Pliny the Elder assures us that it comes from crocs who live on sweet-smelling flowers, so it actually smells quite pleasant. Spoken like a man who's never smeared feces directly onto his face. It's quite possible that men like Pliny are exaggerating on this point, saying that we slather ourselves in excrement as a kind of pot shot at women who go to extreme measures to be beautiful. Or it could be that we are actually willing to go to such lengths because of the age we live in. It's entirely unclear. For those moments where face creams and makeup just isn't going to cut it, we have other means of covering up our skin's imperfections. Namely, little patches called alute or splenia. These teeny leather scraps are sometimes treated with alum, then pasted directly onto the skin as a kind of artful beauty mark. We might even cut them into cute little shapes and turn them into a fashion statement, much like we'll see again in 16th century France. We also want our teeth looking pearly. Black teeth are something we frequently see among slaves and the lower classes. As Ovid tells us, if you've got discolored teeth, you'll have to laugh with those lips firmly closed. You can do yourself untold damage when you laugh if your teeth are black, too long, or irregular. We'll use things like bicarb soda and rinses to try and keep them looking bright. We might also give them a little rinse with some urine. I tell you, urine, it's so versatile! 
When it comes to body hair, of its right, we want to keep everything below our eyebrows to a minimum. Several ancient writers suggest that we take much of our body hair off. Though we have graffiti that suggests some men advocate for a bushy below-stairs carpet, it's a bit too rude to shout out on air, but I'll post it in the show notes. Some women are removing some or all of their feminine shag rug, as we discussed in our episode on pubic hair removal through the ages. Much like the Greeks, we'll be shaving, plucking, ripping it out with resin paste, or scraping it off with a pumice stone. That should be fun, but nothing the time-traveling woman hasn't had a run-in with before. Also like the ancient Greeks, Roman ladies are said to strive for a fuller eyebrow. A writer named Claudian praises a woman's beauty by saying, With how fine a space between do your delicate eyebrows meet on your forehead? We'll be darkening and extending them with makeup to make sure they're as close to a unibrow as possible. And now our slaves are pulling jars and bottles out of a wooden beauty case, getting ready to make us up in ways we're very familiar with today. We're having our eyelashes tinted with ash to make them look fuller. Unmarried daughters especially want to ensure their eyelashes are present and accounted for because, as Pliny the Elder writes, The eyelashes fall off with those persons who are too much given to venereal pleasures. Eyelashes accentuate your chastity, ladies. To further enhance our eyes, there is coal, like the Egyptians use, which we will mix with some oil or fat and paint on with a brush. But we can also avail ourselves of squid ink, antimony, and something called lamp black, sometimes mixed with saffron to help mitigate the smells. Eyeshadow might contain charred, ground rose petals, roasted date stones, or a paste made from toasted ants. Sticky. We might also paint on some rouge to give our cheeks a healthy glow. We have several kinds to choose from, made from red ochre, rose and poppy petals, or red chalk. Some of these ingredients aren't the best smelling, so we are very keen on perfumes. And while we Romans certainly didn't invent personal fragrance, we did inspire the word perfume, which comes from the Latin perfumum, which means through smoke. Remember that we haven't learned yet how to distill alcohol, so to make them we take olive oil and add in some nice smelling plants and woods to steep. We're big fans of many of the same scents as the Egyptians. One rough guesstimate says that by 100 CE, we're using some 2,800 tons of frankincense a year. We sprinkle it on bathroom walls, put it on the soles of our feet, add it to baths, anoint military standards. Some sources whisper that Emperor Nero, who we'll meet in a later episode, loves the smell of roses so much that he has silver pipes installed so his guests can mist themselves with rose water. Pliny tells us that we even put perfume in our drinks. He also says that Romans waste a hundred million sesterces every year. That is the sum which our luxuries and our women cost us. Blaming it on the ladies as always, Pliny. I'll bet you're a barrel of laughs at a party. This seems like a lot of work of a morning, but if we're in the privileged position to afford such beauty rituals, we can't really afford to ignore them. Our makeup, we believe, makes us look healthier, younger, more attractive. Some things never change. The word for such things, medicament or medicamentum, can mean cosmetic, poison, and remedy. These products aren't used solely for the purpose of looking glam. But remember this important fact, restraint is key. We don't want to be too heavy-handed here. Wearing too much makeup can give others the impression that we're cheap, vain, or a woman for hire. And so we see an age-old contradiction. Men want you to look pretty and healthy, darling, but they don't want you to look like you tried too hard. And they certainly don't want to see how you accomplish it. As the ever-lovely Ovid says, Women should keep till the work's perfected. Out of sight. Do I have to know why your complexion's white? Shut the boudoir door. Why show a half-finished painting? Men don't need to know much. Most of what you do would shock us if it weren't concealed from view. Here comes another hot tip from Lucretius, who says we ought to be at greater pains to hide all that is behind the scenes of life. If that doesn't define the Roman woman's lived experience, then I don't know what does. Now for hair. Tell us, Dr. Red. 
Ancient Roman women don't seem to have been big on hats. What they do seem to have been big on is hairdos. Really complicated hairdos. <laughs> Pilot as high as the sky sometimes. <laughs> it just curls as far as the eye can see. Uh, so that, that what, what's in fashion changes a bit. We can sort of see that in the artistic record, like of Roman, you know, of, of busts and that sort of thing of various women. There's definitely certain kinds of hairstyles that are on trend at any one given time, but they're all fairly complicated and probably would not have taken the weight of a hat. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, and they would often be built up with like various false pieces as well to extend the height of them. Yeah, extensions like are that. not a new thing. <laughs> <laughs> the style you're sporting changes depending on who the empress is. Earlier, under Augustus's wife Livia, we have a deceptively simple looking style wavy hair around the temples, a curl near the forehead, and a low bun at the back called a notice. By our current period, our empress is a lively lady named Pompeia Platina, and she's totally a fan of vertically inclined confections, just like the women of the Flavian dynasty that came before her. If you look at statues of our current empress, you'll see that she's a big fan of the 80s-style poof, as well as a fetching headband, which probably helps to hold the style together. I wonder if she's got some kind of bump it situation going on under there. We want our coiffure with many layers. Think of a wedding cake, but made of hair. As Juvenal has it, So important is the business of beautification. So numerous are the tears and stories piled one upon another on her head. It's likely we've got curls galore. Our servants will create them with a calamistrum, or curling iron, which is placed in the fire before being applied to our tresses. We're placing a whole lot of trust in our female slaves. Hairdressing is considered so important that we even have a designated hairdresser called an ornatrix, whose job it is to become an updo expert. We'll also dye our natural hair. Different kinds of dyes come from animal fat, antimony, ashes, henna, or a special soap ball to dye your hair black, red, or even blonde, if you're feeling particularly bold. It seems that it's quite a popular color, giving its wearer an exotic air. But I've read suggestions that the color is one that prostitutes often use to distinguish themselves from fine ladies. There's also evidence that some women even dye their hair blue, but this is apparently also a sex worker's color. Some women get to have all the fun. In fact, later this evening, we might even wear a wig. Around this time, they're very fashionable. I wonder if the Egyptians helped inspire the trend. We might have several to choose from. Black, blonde, or red, all made from natural hair. If the hair comes from a nation or a people that Rome has conquered, all the better. Okay. Now for jewelry. It's very likely that we'll be wearing some. A few fibula, or a kind of pin that keeps our clothing in place and which can act as quite a beautiful piece of jewelry in itself. Necklaces, earrings, bracelets, you name it. We'll see gold and silver, gemstones, and exquisite details. Of course, much like with everything else about our outfits, we'll need to be very conscious not to overdo it. We respectable matroni have to think carefully about how garish our outfits are, as most Romans are suspicious of excess, and seeing it displayed by a woman makes them especially uncomfortable. What shoes we wear will depend on who we are and what we're doing. While inside the house, we're probably wearing slippers or your iconic strappy leather sandals. But for outdoor use, we've got an array of others to choose from. There are more slippers, and we might also have closed-toed shoes and half-boots made of rawhide. Some of these are quite beautiful. I have a picture of an old Roman shoe in the show notes that has exquisite cutout details on it that make it into something that most of us would be happy to rock in our century. And now we are most definitely hot to trot. So, we've digested the grand sweep of Rome's history, settled into life as a patrician woman at the height of the empire, and we're finally dressed and ready to tackle our day. But we'll just have to freeze time for the moment, as we've run out of time for this episode. And we have a lot more to cover. So much, in fact, that I'm breaking this deep dive into the ancient Roman woman's life into not two, but three parts. 
See you next week as we explore our house, meet our husband and talk about marriage, explore our complex relationship with our father, and meet some of the most powerful women in Rome, the Vestal Virgins. Until next time. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, consider becoming a patron. It really helps me keep the show going, and it gives you access to exclusive deals and bonus episodes. Some of the ones coming up will include my full interviews with Dr. Rad, Dr. G, and Dr. Evans, which you won't want to miss. You can also leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, which helps new listeners find me. Another way to support the show and get yourself a fetching present is to check out the Explorers merchandise shop, where you'll find lady-centric timelines, detailed maps, and women's history greeting cards and art prints made just for you. To read the transcript for this episode, plus a full list of my research sources, lots of images, and more, just go to this episode's show notes on my website, theexplorespodcast.com. You'll also find me on Instagram and Facebook at The Explores Podcast and Twitter at The Explores Pod. A huge thanks to Dr. Rhiannon Evans, Dr. Rad, and Dr. G for going time traveling with us. You didn't hear a lot from Dr. Evans this episode, but she has a lot to say in the next one, and I can't wait to share it with you. If you want to hear more from them about ancient Rome, look no further than their podcasts, The Partial Historians and Emperors of Rome, both of which really helped me pull my work on this era together. You'll find links to both shows in the show notes. The music you just enjoyed comes courtesy of Michael Levy, who composes music using recreated lyres from antiquity to give us beautiful glimpses into the ancient world. To find out more about his work, check out the show notes. Thanks as always to Mr. Explores, Paul Goblonski, for my theme music, logo, and the amazing graphics he keeps patiently making for the Explores. And thanks to the following legends for their vocal stylings. Phil Chevalier, John Armstrong, Sean from the excellent podcast Stories of Your and Yours, Andrew Your Gold, Paul Gablonski, Simon Dinatris, and the lovely Lauren McDougall. 